Welcome to our um, second cafe and our sixth season of Archaeology Cafe. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it seems like a beautiful night. Um, I see some new faces and my microphone just went out. Tonight our speaker is Paul Reed uh, from Archaeology Southwest. Um, this is his third Archaeology Cafe appearance and we're going to be talking about Chuskas and Chaco. So Paul, I'll just go ahead and have you take it away while I go hunt for the batteries. All right. Thanks, Doug. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you all tonight. Um, I hope you enjoy the food and the wine. And I will try to keep it to about three hours. Does that sound good for everybody? <laughs> and then we'll have a five or six hour question and answer after that. And if anybody's still alive, well, we'll figure that out later. Um, now, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the guidelines and I'll be happy to keep my ear piece on to take all your questions. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've worked for Archaeology Southwest or the Center for Desert Archaeology for about 13 years now. Um, prior to that, I was employed by Navajo Nation Archaeology Department in Farmington, and I worked on a variety of projects the first couple of years. And then um, in 1990, I was fortunate enough to be put in a position of running a Rhodes Archaeology program out of the Farmington office um, in New Mexico. And for the next decade or so, I did a number of different projects um, up and down, mostly the Chusca Valley. So um, that experience has allowed me to, I think, gain some insights into what's going on in this very rich archaeological area in the Chusca Valley. Um, if you look at your handout, um, the first page of it has a map that um, gives you a pretty good sense of where the Chusca Valley is. Um, the Chusca Valley is just about 50 miles west of Chaco Canyon, and I should say that we call it a valley, but it's not a river valley. The Chusca Valley is a structural valley, um, and it's essentially the slope coming off. Sorry, I'm going to switch the mic here. It's the slope, the slope coming off the Chusca Mountains and then sloping into the San Juan Basin um, towards Chaco Canyon and the Chaco River where it makes its great bend um, to head to the north and drain into the San Juan River. Um, so the Chusca Valley is, is not a place that people normally think of um, when they think of sort of archaeological areas with um, great antiquity or depth in the process of doing archaeology. Of course, when we think about the northern southwest, northern New Mexico, we think of Chaco Canyon. Um, we think of Mesa Verde. We think of Canyon de Che. Um, certainly a number of other areas in, you know, in the greater southwest. But the Chusca Valley, for me, really does correspond to one of the great archaeological hearths or heartlands of the ancient Southwest. Um, and I hope in the few minutes that I speak to you to really be able to convey to you um, the importance of this area. Um, and in, in what I'm going to do in part for you is contrast sort of the view that we have of the Chusca Valley archaeologically in professional writing and research with one that um, myself and several other people have developed over the last couple of decades. Um, in, in sort of Chacoan archaeology or the Chacoan parlance, the Chusca Valley is often seen as a resource area, um, as a relative periphery to the core area at Chaco Canyon. Um, and I think that relegating the Chusca Valley to just being a raw material area, um, an area where ceramics were produced and other materials were produced and traded into Chaco Canyon, which we do have strong evidence for, by the way, but I think that interpretation really barely scratches the surface for what really makes the Chusca Valley a phenomenon and a, and a phenomenal archaeological area. So what I want to sketch for you tonight briefly is sort of the chronology and the really interesting history of the Chusca Valley. So what I need you to do with me is to come on a journey with me to go back in time and we'll go back to about 1000 BC. Um, this is the beginnings of the broadly defined basket maker two period in the Pueblo sequence. Um, and you know, there's some areas at this point with research pushing those dates back where we might have basket maker two type adaptations, perhaps as early as 1200. Um, there's some definitional issues there that I won't bore you with, but by 1000 BC in many areas of the Southwest and certainly by five or 600 BC, we have folks in a number of locales across the Southwest who are doing the Basket Maker 2 adaptation. And what that means is they are farming, they're growing corn. Um, they're not growing corn particularly intensively at that point, but they are beginning to depend on corn. They are still heavily adapted to hunting. 
We have large um, corner notch projectile points, which are kind of the hallmark of the Basket Maker II period. Um, and they're using a lot of uh, a large variety of gathered plant materials. So um, one way to talk about it is that these folks are essentially hunter gatherers who have begun to add corn, you know, possibly other cultigens, although we don't have really strong evidence at this point at five or 600 BC. But these folks are essentially hunters and gatherers who are starting to work corn into their diet. Um, what's really interesting about this period, and this is not just in the Chuska Valley, but any, anywhere we encounter it, is that we have a long period of time where we know people had the knowledge of corn horticulture, where they were planting corn, they were harvesting corn, but their adaptation, their basic adaptation to the land, and we think their seasonal movements across the landscape really hadn't changed, um, even though corn was added. So um, if, even though we see corn as early as 2000 BC in places, um, we don't have a change in this basic hunting and gathering adaptation with the corn added in until about 8,500. So 2,500 years later, we finally begin to see the changes that mark a transition away from this primarily hunting and gathering adaptation with corn in the mix to one that we would begin to describe as more on a sedentary Pueblo type trajectory. Um, and that's in the period that we define as the Basket Maker III period. I put this in the Chuska Valley between about 8,500 and about 750. Um, so that goes a little bit into what other people call Pueblo I. I think that really encompasses well this developmental period um, for the early Puebloans. Um, let, me, let me circle back for a minute. So we're at five or 600 BC, we're in the Chuska Valley. We have probably on the order of dozens, perhaps the low hundreds of sites up and down this large structural valley that runs you know, almost 80 or 90 miles. So in Basket Maker 2, based on the archeological data we have from you know, over a century of survey and all the work that, that has been done, a relatively low intensity of these sites. Um, in part, this is a visibility issue because these sites are pre-pottery in Basket Maker 2 and um, they're typically buried very deeply on the landscape because of their age. Um, so we've got a very low density of sites. Um, so let's shift forward in time, 500 BC, across the AD, BC AD um, boundary into the Common Era. By AD 500, we have hundreds of sites on the landscape. So essentially over this thousand year period, and really mostly the last 500 years of that, from the Common Era boundary to AD 500, we have a relative population explosion in the Chuska Valley and really in many of the areas that we look at across the northern southwest. So we have people becoming highly adapted to corn and really taking on corn cultivation and agriculture as much more of a full-time pursuit than they had done in the previous 2,000 years. Um, and this is actually one of the mysteries that we still explore in archeology span to this day, is with knowledge of corn from at least 2000 BC, how come it took you know, two millennia and a half to AD 500 for things to really take off? Um, one of the factors that we plug into this is the cultivation of beans. So that by AD 500, we begin to see beans showing up in many, many contexts where we previously had not seen them. Coincident with that, we have really an explosion of ceramic technology. So pottery and pottery making comes on the scene, and it's actually earlier. We have pottery in the Four Corners area in the Chuska Valley as early as 8150 or 200, but we don't really begin to see the changes associated with most groups taking on pottery manufacture until about 450 or 500. The beans then come on the scene and the pottery comes on the scene. Well, what do hard ceramic vessels allow you to do, folks, with beans? You can cook them, okay? They, they finally stopped barbecuing their beans, which must have been the worst adaptation imaginable. Can you imagine trying to stack beans on the barbecue grill and not having them fall through? Um, anyway, so they had these hard vessels, right? And we all love to eat beans. Well, I'll confess, I do. Um, but to eat beans well and to get rid of some of the ill effects of beans and the gaseous side, you have to cook the hell out of your beans. Well, hard ceramic vessels gave people the ability to do that. So that, those two things came in together, we think within probably decades of each other in the late 400s and 500s. So take the beans, the corn, the ceramic vessels, certainly the other cultivated items. Um, we pair those up then with 
the emergence of really large, well-planned pit house structures. So we have pit houses in the southwestern archaeological record that go back to 5000 BC or even earlier. People are living in below ground dwellings way early. They're typically pre-basket maker three, pretty informal, small structures, two or three meters across. Well, by 500, 550, in the Chusca Valley specifically, we have large five, six, seven meter pit house structures that are a couple of meters below ground, are highly elaborated. They have large main dwellings. They have small antechamber dwellings that allowed people access. They have corn grinding facilities. They have hearths. They have storage facilities. So at this point, People are well adapted to growing corn agriculture. They're storing food inside the houses. They're storing them as well outside the houses in what we call extramural bins or features. Um, but by this point, people are pretty much fully adapted to growing corn agriculture. And I talk about them at that point being on really the fully committed Anasazi or, or Pueblo path. Um, and this is a process that archeologists in the past have talked about not really emerging until Pueblo I after 700 or even 800. But in the Chusca Valley specifically, we have a number of locales where people are fully sedentary and they're committed to living there. Now we do have quite a bit of mobility on the landscape still. So, you know, I don't want that to be confusing for folks. We have people who are committing to sedentary living, but they are moving their main residences every generation, sometimes more often than that. So we do end up with quite a few structures spread across the landscape that represent different periods of time. Um, by 700 then, in this area, we have the, the first true villages. So we have sites with 40 or 50 pit houses, more than half or a quarter of which of those are contemporaneous. So we sort of fit an anthropological definition of 50 people living in one place at one time, which a lot of folks kick out as sort of the, the minimum threshold for a village level residence, that many people interacting. You know, and, and people have typically pushed this later into the Pueblo I period as well. What we see in the Chusca Valley though, and this is up and down the valley from the north at Cove, Arizona, down to the Newcomb area, which is about halfway to Gallup, all the way down to the Tohatchie Valley, which is on the southern end, um, just 20 or so miles from Gallup, New Mexico, is people living in these fairly large sedentary communities up and down the valley, um, by 600, and then by 700, we have the earliest villages. Um, the next interesting transition we see is early Pueblo I from 750 to about 800. A lot of these original Basket Maker III settlements are abandoned. People are leaving them, and they're moving. This corresponds more or less pretty well with some climatic change that we see in the area. Um, we had a drying out of the climate, and it got colder, pretty much regionally, what we see in the tree ring data. Um, so with these folks adapted to growing corn, mostly along river courses, what we call alluvial floodwater farming, um, as the climate started to dry out, they really didn't have the adaptations at that point to begin growing corn or continue growing corn in those areas. So we see a shift up upland, basically higher in elevation. So some of the lower areas, the lowland areas are abandoned by 700, 725, 750, and people are moving into more upland areas. Well, they didn't move permanently. What we see later in the 900s, the 925s, is perhaps the descendants of some of these same groups or new groups moving back into areas that the Basket Maker III folks had occupied and then building large Pueblo II structures at 900, 950, and 1,000. So, um, so we really have in the Chusca Valley, a number of locales, fairly complicated site complexes that have Basket Maker III sites in the 600s and 700s, and then Pueblo II sites in the 900s and after 1000, excuse me, literally built right on top of each other. One site that I was fortunate enough to work on in Cove, Arizona, way up north, um, had a Basket Maker III pit house that we dated, I think, with tree rings right around 700. Um, and what we found was that original basket maker pit house had fallen out of use, been abandoned. Folks came back 300 years later at about 80, 10, 10, I think was our tree ring date. And they literally reworked the original basket maker three main chamber into a Pueblo two Kiva. They took features, architectural features built into the floor of that house and converted them for use as a later kiva. Um, we didn't have a lot of evidence of occupation in the intervening 300 years. Um, so it was a real interesting situation where 
Perhaps it was descendants of the original family that built that house who came back and moved right into the same space. Sort of knowing what we know about people and how structures are used, um, I think there's a pretty strong case can be made that we didn't have strangers coming back and re-inhabiting an old structure, but rather the folks were trying to reconnect with their ancestors through use of the, the exact same domestic space. So, very interesting situation. Okay, so let's say we're in the 81,000s now. We've gone through this period of development in the Chuska Valley with people having contact and trade with outside areas um, as evidenced through the presence of different ceramic types and vessels that have come in, shell that's come in from California and from Texas, um, some obsidian that's come in from Hamas and other sources, but not really a huge volume of trade prior to about 81,000. Well, at 81,000, of course, Chaco Canyon is really going great guns. Um, at that point, we see a shift in settlement in the Chuska Valley. Many, many of these communities built small great houses in some cases, larger great houses. When I say small, a number of the ones in the Chuska Valley are 10, 15, 20 room, 30 room structures. Um, this is contrasted, of course, with Pueblo Benito with perhaps 700 rooms, Tetro Kettle, 600 rooms. Um, my favorite site in the north, Salmon Ruins, 300 rooms, Aztec Ruins, over 400. So typically the ones in the Chuska Valley in the Chaco period were much smaller. Um, the largest site that I'm aware of in the Chuska Valley is the site of Skunk Springs. It's on your handout. Um, this site probably had 100 to 125 rooms. Um, there's, there's some question there. The site's never been excavated uh, in the modern era. Had some picking, probably some pot hunting in the past. Um, most of the sites in the Chuska Valley are in this smaller class of sites. Um, the other interesting question that we can look at for the Chuska Valley, and this is something that I've done more extensively in the middle San Juan, the area around Solomon and Aztec and the Four Corners, is look at the attributes that make sites great houses and then try to evaluate those sites against sort of the prototype sites in Chaco Canyon. Um, you know, this, this talk isn't about Chaco, but I'm gonna spend the next three hours because God, everybody loves Chaco, right? <laughs> um, we, we can't really talk about the Chaco periphery or the areas on the edge of Taco, Chaco without something about Chaco. Um, so one of the things that's interested me for two decades now is, are the sites that look like they were built by Chacoans, were they actually built by Chacoans, you know, migrants out of Chaco Canyon or architects, builders, planners, or were they built by local people, you know, the other side of the model, the emulation model, hey, these guys have giant big structures, they seem to produce a lot of corn, you know, they have good connections to the deities, things seem to be going well, so we're going to build our own great house structure and then convince the Chacoans that we can join their trading network, maybe join their ritual network, and sort of have the benefits of Chaco, even though we're certainly not, you know, people from Chaco Canyon ourselves. So that's the local model. Based on research that different folks have done, um, it's my sense that most of the sites in the Chuska Valley are homegrown sites. So they're mostly local people who grew out of those early basket maker three roots, certainly with people moving around here and there. But I think essentially holding on to some of those territories from the 600s in some fashion. And then as Chaco came along, those leaders in the area and the people decided to build large structures that we call great houses to connect to Chaco. The one at Skunk Springs, I think, makes a strong case for perhaps an actual migrant site with Chacoans coming out to build the site and then perhaps recruit local people to live in it. That's the model that um, I've basically pursued and promoted for Solomon Ruins, an initial group of 75 folks coming out of Chaco Canyon to the north, building the site, and then another 100 or so or more people recruited to live in the site in what we would consider today a multi-ethnic setting. That may have been the case in the Chuska Valley at Skunk Springs. Um, most of the other sites, the assessment that I've been able to do with mostly surface information, so lacking the excavation details and some of the more detailed architectural work that we really need to decode some of these attributes, most of the sites seem local to me. But, you know, I think there's great potential there for additional future research. Um, so let's move into the 1200s, kind of post-Chaco era. Um, what we see is a contraction in the area actually occupied by people in the Chuska Valley. So we have some of the locales that have had people since Basket Maker 3 
still having supporting Pueblo three populations. Um, but many of the areas occupied for those 600 years from 600 to 1200 essentially are abandoned or depopulated. And then we have a concentration of people in a much smaller number of locales, but we do see bigger sites at any point in the Chusca Valley in the 1200s than at any other point on the landscape. And this, I think, mirrors what we see across most of the northern Pueblo landscape as well, where sites are growing to their largest extent by probably 1230, 1240, 1250. So in the Chusca Valley, we have a number of really spectacular sites, a site known as Crumbled House, um, which is built, was built in the 1200s, um, built as a fortress site on an isolated mesa remnant with a number of defensive features, limited access to the site, and a large wall around it. We have another site called The Gap, which is close to Crumbled House, a little bit north, also built in a defensive setting. There's a feature that looks, for all intents and purposes, like a moat, like a medieval moat. It was a ditch dug out right outside the walls of this Pueblo, which then has a wall, an encircling wall around it. So um, whether it was ever filled with water, we certainly can't say, but these were very defensive structures built in a period of time in Pueblo III in the 1200s, where we begin to see signs of conflict pretty much anywhere we look in the northern southwest. And I think the sites there are reflecting that pattern as well, that whether or not people are erupting in open conflict or warfare, they're definitely thinking about the possibility of being attacked by other people. Um, we think about the classic settlement pattern at Mesa Verde with people building in highly inaccessible rock shelters. The biggest sites ever built in these, in these rock shelters and cliff settings are after 1225 or 1230. Prior to this on Mesa Verde and other areas, people made some excursions into upper areas. They stored grain, occasionally lived up there. But by 1225, 1230, we have pretty much wholesale movement of people into these highly protected defensive locations. This has been debated for more than 100 years at least. I, for one, came, come down on the side of these folks were afraid of conflict. Whether or not they had actual conflict with people, and we see that at some sites in southwest Colorado, Sand Canyon, Castle Rock Pueblo, some signs at Goodman Point. Um, Solomon Pueblo has some interesting signs of warfare, not a strong signature, same for Aztec ruins. The point is by 1240, 1250, in much of the northern southwest, people are thinking about conflicts and they are moving either into inaccessible spots or they're building bigger and bigger sites where presumably they felt like there was safety in numbers. So this is a pattern that we see in the Chusca Valley as well. Um, okay, so we're in the 1200s. Um, by 1280, 1290, the area begins to be depopulated. Actually, as early as 1260, people are leaving. So that by 1290 or 1300, there are essentially no people living in the huge core area of the ancient Pueblo landscape. So the middle San Juan is emptied out, Mesa Verde is emptied, the Chusca Valley is emptied, southeast Utah was abandoned actually decades before 1210 or 1220. So pretty much the area is completely depopulated and the Chusca Valley pretty much fits this pattern. Um, I've personally found sort of a handful of ceramic sherds, um, Rio Grande glazewares for those of you who know them, from the 1300s and 1400s occasionally on sites in the Chusca Valley. But um, for all intents and purposes, it was abandoned as a residential Pueblo homeland completely for folks of that affiliation and really wasn't reoccupied again by the Navajo and their, their early ancestors until I think the earliest site I know of maybe just before 1600 on the eastern side and not too long after that on the west. Um, so essentially 300 years of largely unoccupied territory. You know, those Pueblo four sherds tell us that people went through there some things were happening, but the area is pretty much abandoned. Um, and that's, that's actually the end of my Chusca Valley tale for you. So um, I could say a lot more, but I would prefer to hear from you and have you ask me whatever, whatever it is um, you would like to talk about. Um, have you seen any evidence of water control systems in the Chusca Valley? Oh At yeah. any time they're, period? They're extensive. Um, the area around Captain Tom Wash is one that a current project, the um, Paleo West folks are doing the Navajo Gallup big water pipeline that runs from the north, from the San Juan River, all the way down the Gallup and has a number of branches and spurs. And they're investigating an area near Captain Tom Wash, which for folks to orient you, that's about halfway down the Chusca Valley. 
in sort of the vicinity of Newcomb. And there is an extensive um, ditch system um, and bordered field system that seems to go well back into the Pueblo period. They haven't dated all of those aspects real clearly. Um, the other evidence comes from the work of um, Stu Peckham and Jack Wilson in the 1960s, um, the Chuska Valley Project, uh, an early archeological re reconnaissance or recon. Um, their survey identified a number of check dams, um, bordered fields, and the types of facilities that suggest that people were controlling soil and water and um, were definitely trying to boost their agricultural yields. Uh, I have a quick question. You were, you were talking about the sort of the, the trend towards sedentism and permanent villages. What sort of lines of evidence do you use to look at for how, uh, how people are tending towards uh, sedentary behaviors? All right. Um, what, what we want to look for is evidence that people are living in one area for at least probably nine months out of the year and per perhaps as much as 12 months. Um, it's, it's fairly difficult to prove that people actually lived in a single facility for that whole period of time. But essentially what we look for is evidence that the full range of harvested goods, hunted goods, gathered goods are available or were found in the remains in those particular structures. Um, the other thing, of course, that we look at before even getting to some of the more specific um, botanical or subsistence remains is the size of the structures. I contrasted for you um, really early structures that go well back into the archaic period that are you know, essentially little more than saucer-shaped holes dug in the ground that people might have had an informal hearth or fire pit in um, to the much more elaborate structures by 500, 550, 600 where people are spending time digging out large structures. They're putting a whole lot of effort into permanent large hearths. Um, hearth features in particular tell us that people were living in structures probably through the winter time. Um, you know, there's some debate there, but if people are making the investment to put a central hearth into a pit house or a room um, or a suite of rooms, then they're making a commitment to stay warm all winter. Um, and that's a pretty good indication. The other issue is, you know, archaic peoples are highly mobile. So um, if people are moving around a lot, there's simply no reason to invest a whole lot of effort into a more permanent structure. Um, that you then abandon for three months or six months out of the year because when you return, guess what? It's taken over by the bugs and the dust and the dirt and the rodents. Um, and if you have seasonal cabins, you return to them, no matter how well you've sealed them off, they've got mice, right? So this was a problem for folks in the past as well. So there's a number of different ways that we can kind of get at that. Uh, can you say anything about bones and the proportion of bones from one kind of animal or another through time. In other words, how did uh, animal protein figure into diets and what changes were there? Okay. Um, yeah, it's it, it certainly, to some extent, we would have to talk about specific sites, but, but the broad trends indicate that early on folks were exploiting a pretty broad range of animals. So we have evidence of cottontails, jackrabbits, pocket gophers, you know, all the sort of small game and quite a few rodents, um, some, some of whom probably got into the structures after, others who were definitely consumed perhaps as less desirable emergency foods. And then of course we have the bigger um, artiodactyls, deer, elk, um, bighorn sheep occasionally. Um, and then when we get later in time, well the interesting thing to, to, to back up for a minute, as early as 600, um, in the Basque Maker III period, we have evidence of turkeys being cultivated and, you know, turkey husbandry. Um, and we think at that period of time, based on the lack of turkey bones as subsistence remains, that it was primarily about the feathers and that people were raising turkeys so they could have, in particular, the tail feathers, um, probably in ritual uses. Well, they go through nearly 600 years without a whole lot of turkey consumption. This is something I've wondered a lot about. We even have two turkey burials in the Chaco period at Solomon Ruins where the turkeys were buried formally, you know, as macaws and eagles frequently are in different sites. So these birds clearly had significance, you know, maybe a stretch to say ritual, but they certainly put a lot of effort into it. Well, by 1200 at Solomon, Aztec, almost any site we look at, I think the Chuska Valley would hold up, um, people are eating turkeys and that becomes their primary protein source. So we have a shift in general if we do just the later periods, Chaco an emphasis on artiodactyls, deer, elk, um, to a much heavier emphasis on turkeys. Um, 
And the interesting thing about that is the turkeys were largely fed well, probably some natural bug, you know, picking through plazas, but they were corn fed. So by the middle 1200s, we probably had people depending on corn to almost 90%. If you count all the corn they were eating, all the corn they were feeding their turkeys. So sort of in broad measure, that's what we're looking at. During the Pueblo II period, when there's great houses being constructed throughout the region, are there communities that are not focused on Chacoan architecture? There is, and that's one of the real interesting um, questions for me is, you know, we, you know, and I'm guilty of this as well, we, we get into the Chaco time period and the great houses are really cool. And they also code a lot of information that the architecture can tell us if we have enough exposed architecture that we don't necessarily get from smaller sites. Um, excuse me. So there's been a natural emphasis in some ways and probably an over emphasis on the large sites. Um, but in the Tusca Valley, we have clusters of habitation sites um, non great house sites that don't have either a great house or a great kiva. You know, I couldn't tabulate for you, Matt, the numbers, but I think there's a sizable percentage of those communities, maybe 10, 15%, that don't have public architecture, either a great kiva or a great house, um, and yet people are living there and somehow managed to survive, right? So um, that's one of the more interesting questions is. Were those people, were those folks simply outside most of the Chaco networks, whether they were connected to Chaco through lineages or migrants or just connected through trade and you know, marriage arrangements or whatever, were those folks living a, a quasi-independent life? What we see from different projects is quite a bit of trade goods, so it suggests that they're not disconnected from those networks, but that there are different tiers that probably operated. That's what I would guess. The project you had at Cove, are you considering that part of the Chuska Valley or is that kind of peripheral or because it seemed to me that it was kind of geographically not, but you don't. I'm biased. So I put Cove as the far northern extension of the Chuska Valley. Now, technically speaking, it's around the curve of the mountains. You go around the Chuska Mountains, they become the Lukachukai Mountains, and then you go another 15, 20 miles, 25 kilometers, and then you're in Cove. But um, culturally, architecture-wise, ceramic-wise, all the material items we look at, Cove is connected to the Chuska Valley. They make trachyte, they made trachyte tempered pottery in different periods. They exploited different sources for those based on the research we did than the folks further down the mountain, which makes sense. Um, people generally don't go a great distance to get their temper. I'm not sure what Barbara would say about the furthest. 25 kilometers, I don't know if even that far, but um, it's heavy to carry that stuff. So, but the interesting thing is even with different materials, different resources, they fit pretty well within that tradition. We did at Cove have a much stronger connection across the mountains to the west to the Kayenta area. So at Cove, we had, I think, ceramics from that area at as high as 25 or 30% um, trade wear, which we don't see further down the Chuska Valley or Slope. So definitely interesting. but. I, I, I put them in there. Call me biased. You're biased. <laughs> uh, two questions, really. Any evidence that IKEA was present at that time? <laughs> Just hints, only hints. <laughs> and can you tell if one group might push out another group? Or if gentrification might have occurred? <laughs> um. It's an interesting question because I think the, um, the overlay or the invasion, if you will, of Chaco and architecture that happened across a large swath of the, of the San Juan Basin probably changed social dynamics and relationships tremendously. Um, you know, and I'm going to bounce to the north for a minute. You'll forgive me. I, I spent some time up there. Um, at Solomon Ruins, when, when Solomon Pueblo was built at 1090, um, based on a number of touring dates, um, they built a massive site in an area that had seen limited settlement um, going back into the 600s and certainly wandering people well back in Paleo Indian and Archaic times, but basically no commitment to permanent habitation there in that vicinity on the San Juan River until folks came up in the late 10 hundreds. Um, once they came, they built this massive 300 room structure. So, you know, I would say without question that changed the social dynamics of the neighborhood completely and, you know, irretrievably for anything that happened after that. Um, the Chuska Valley is a little bit different setting because I think, I'm trying to think of a locale, I think 
almost every locale, yeah, even including Skunk Springs, which to me looks like the best case for Chaco and migrants coming from the west 50 miles, building that big site. Um, in, in every case I can think of, great houses were put in or near existing Pueblo communities. So areas that may have had earlier Basket Maker 3 and Pueblo 1 structures, but certainly by, excuse me, 81,000 or 1050, had pretty good sized Pueblo 2 communities. And what I'm speaking of here are smaller sites with eight to 10 to 14 to 20 rooms, kivas in their plazas. Um, and in some cases, um, the site at Newcomb was placed into a community that had dozens of structures that either date just before Newcomb or perhaps date contemporaneously with it. So um, it's a real different pattern where we see Chaco and presence in areas without prior settlement, whereas you know the Chacoans mostly moved into areas that had prior Pueblo settlement. And that tends to complicate models for was this great house built by people from Chaco who stayed and lived there, or was it simply designed by Chaco and architects and builders who then went back to the canyon or went on to the next construction project, literally. So Chaco and architecture is such a specialized form. There was nothing like it pre-Chacoan and post-Chacoan people built in different ways. The sites got bigger in Pueblo three and certainly in Pueblo four, much bigger. Um, we think about Zuni and Pecos, these giant, you know, proto-historic and historic sites with thousands of rooms. They don't look like Chaco and Great Houses. So the Chaco and architectural form really is a distinct form if we look earlier and we look later. So it may not be a stretch to think about a class of quasi full-time specialists who were Chaco and designers, architects, and masons who actually built these structures. Now, whether they lived in the sites or not, I mean, the model I've talked about and built for Salmon has the Chacoans living in the site based on non-architectural evidence, ceramics and other things. These other areas we don't have nearly the level of information because one of the mysteries for the Chusco Valley is a handful of sites, like I was saying, have had research uh, at the turn of the prior century, 20s, 30s, and certainly pot hunting, but there hasn't been a large-scale archaeological project done on a Chusco Valley Great House. So some of these questions we may not be able to address unless something changes and, you know, a future project ends up there. Um, hi, Paul. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a request and a question. You, you have a picture of Broken Flute Cave, but you didn't mention it, I don't think. Um, and if you could talk about it a little. And then my question is, um, corn has almost more of a cultural than a subsistence importance, um, at wherever it is. Um, now, you answered it a little with they fed it to their turkeys, but it was after the turkeys lost their cultural significance or, or their cultural significance lessened. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little in terms of why they were growing corn at the beginning and then later on. Um, I know a lot of that information sometimes comes from pottery, and I don't know how much of the pottery you found was decorated, especially the early pottery. Anyway, two okay. things um, to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Broken Flute is an amazing site, and I could literally do an entire archaeology cafe on that. But um, the, the short story is Broken Flute is a site that's um, on the Navajo Nation. It's um, just across the line from New Mexico into Arizona. and. You know, to my mind, it's the most phenomenal basket maker two to three site that exists anywhere. Um, it's, it's a huge structure with um, the arc of the cave is literally a quarter of a mile around the rim. So you enter the cave and measuring it all the way around its rim, it's 1,200 feet. Um, it held, um, you know, sort of the, the, the total number of structures is on the order of 22 pit houses and a great Kiva circle, as it was described. Um, Broken Flute has a, a really long history. Um, it was certainly known before Earl Morris went in there, but he went in there with um, Clayton Witherell, and I think first in 1929, and then came back in 1930 and 31 with the Carnegie Institute, a Carnegie Institute-sponsored expedition, and spent, I think, two weeks in 30, and then six weeks in 31, 
pretty much excavated as much of the site as he could. Um, full excavation strategy in those days. Um, not a preservation archaeology strategy, right, Bill? Um, but, um, you know, an amazing collection that is, is mostly at ASM. I think there might be a few items here and there, including a collection of four flutes, um, four rim flutes, you know, blown from the end. Um, and it, it's interesting you bring that up because I was going to speak about this anyway. Um, a friend, a uh, recent friend of mine, a guy named Gary Strozos, is an amazing flute player. Um, he's actually an Italian-American guy, but he does flutes. He's played with different Native American groups, played at Zuni and a whole bunch on the plains. Gary plays a replica flute of one of the ones from Broken Flute, and he actually played an Amarin just uh, last week. Um, and we're, we're trying to develop a project where we can film Gary playing the flutes, um, we're going to talk about the contributions of Earl Morris and then a little bit about the archaeology. Um, one of Gary's other big emphases is, is, emphases is um, talking to Native kids and introducing them to this music and seeing, you know, if, if they would get interested in it. Um, so anyway, those, and of course Gary plays a replica, not the original flutes, but those are at ASM and I don't know if you can see them or not, but um, there's photos online. Um, so corn. Um, yeah, the, the corn, I think, I, I think the corn had both cultural significance and a great deal of subsistence import. I don't think we can slice out those two things. I think they're intimately tied. One of the problems I think we have sometimes, those of us who are um, of European descent um, and tend to dichotomize things, is I think we split up things that people in more indigenous communities worldwide tend to put together. So I would sort of dodge your question in a way, Donna, and say that corn both had ceremonial significance, great cultural significance, and subsistence significance. And I think it's hard to detangle all those. But feeding it to the turkeys, I don't think, was in any way degrading it or, or, or disrespecting it. I think they simply saw that turkeys like corn, as anybody who's dealt with turkeys knows. And it was a lot easier to feed them that way and keep them from running off. Um, so, There's been a lot of discussion about migration and the depopulation of the Four Corners. Uh, the Mesa Verde folks moving to the Rio Grande, uh, northeastern Arizona folks moving down here, for example. But I rarely hear Chuska mentioned. So do you think the Chuska were more affiliated with Mesa Verde and went with the Mesa Verde depopulation? Or was there some other process going on? Ah, that's a, thanks, Barbara. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, for my part, that they were a distinct cultural group, and, and even the communities up and down the valley, related to each other, related to people in Chaco, related to people in Mesa Verde. But I'm not one who draws a huge circle around the northern southwest and says, this is all one big community. It's way too much territory. And they all have significant deep histories of their own. Um, so that, that only tells me that you know, they might have been related to those people, but they weren't the same people. Um, Language-wise, as you know, it's, it's a toss-up. It's further south, which would tend me to think that they're more likely to be Western Karis speakers, perhaps. Um, you know, people have speculated that about that in Chaco with connections between the Acoma story of emergence and the White House, White House in Acoma and their origin myth being tied to Chaco or Benito. You know, it, we, we can't prove that. It, it seems like a good possibility. Um, Chaco and ceramic patterns were definitely replicated very well at Acoma in some of their pottery post-1300. Um, so I don't know really about the Chusca Valley. I, I think people probably went on, you know, left the site and abandoned it in what we talk about as migration streams, probably rarely an entire village, maybe occasionally in a catastrophic event, but we've got streams of families and lineages, maybe clan segments, leaving to go to different areas where they had contacts. Um, the Chuska Valley folks may well have gone south to Zuni. I don't know, Matt, do we have a big bounce in Zuni at 1310, 1320? Not really, and we don't really have, we have some of it at Acoma, but we've got tons of people around Acoma who the origin stories and some of the archeology span suggest gathered at Acoma and not from that far north. So I think it's a real, I think it's a real open question. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if significant numbers of those people pretty much migrated straight east though and ended up somewhere in the reaches of the Rio Grande, Jamez, 
um, somewhere further downriver. Following that thread, I'm wondering if you had any, uh, uh, any archaeologists have had any indications that there was any movement at all toward the Chin Li washes and in that direction, uh, considering we're going to have people following water. You know, we've got people right. moving toward the Rio Grande and it's it, considering the proximity too of the Chusca Valley to people's um, having access to water in the Chinle area. Uh, what are you finding in that instance? Well, um, I don't know of any sites or anyone talking about that kind of a trans mountain migration late in the 1200s. I think we have people going across at earlier points in time. We definitely have indications of that. Cove is in the northern reaches on our map, so almost really to the four corners, well, in Arizona here. So we definitely have strong possibility of people migrating west. But, you know, the problem with a late Pueblo III migration to the west directly is this entire area is depopulated by 1300. I mean, as far as we can tell, there might have been some remnant population, you know, groups of people who hung on, as it were. But the other issue, since you brought up water and drought, is it's not my opinion that the, drought, the great drought, the so-called great drought, caused the abandonment. If we look at the process of abandonment in the places where I've looked at it best, and again, this isn't the Chusca Valley because we don't have the data, but in the middle San Juan, at Salmon and Aztec, by 1280, we have people moving and beginning to leave or actually on the move. This is based on the absence of a specific pottery type, Pinedale Poly, which time period is basically 1275 and beyond. We have none of that type at either Salmon or Aztec, and we have basically the other however many types in that White Mountain Redware sequence up to that point. So that tells me that folks probably left those sites by 1280. If we look at the timing of the Great Drought, we're basically looking from about 1273 to 1299. Um, and the Great Drought really isn't the worst drought that hit the Southwest. For those of you who've looked into this, there was a much greater drought that occurred that pretty much, in my mind, was the final nail in the Chaco coffin, um, if we can say that, or at least helped sort of prevent Chaco from bouncing back. That drought was 1130, a minor improvement at 1160, and then 30 more years of pretty pro, you know, long-term progressive drought until 1190. So that was a 60-year span with just a little bit of climate improvement in the middle of that sequence. That completely, that drought shut down building and a lot of construction activity and really a lot of movement of people. So it's, we're pretty hard pressed as we look to find sites dated between 1130 and 1190. There are some. The sites, big sites like Salmon and Aztec seem to have held on with remnant populations and then they rebounded in the late 1100s and 1200s and then grew to the largest size they would grow to. But to jump to the other drought, um, you know, if, if people were on the move in the late 1270s or 1280s, they had begun to feel the effects of that drought to some extent, but it really hadn't had the full span of 27 years, which is what the, the drought is measured, you know, in triggering years that we see. So I think people were already on the move, thinking about moving um, in the first few years of that drought. And it certainly didn't help the situation, but I think they were moving primarily for social reasons. I think there's a strong possibility that some sort of ritual issue problem came about that essentially made the internal area, the central Pueblo area, uninhabitable for people. Because we didn't have just this area moving over here, these folks moving over here. We have a complete depopulation on the order of tens of thousands of people leaving a homeland and individual homelands up and down these different valleys where they had lived for 2,000 years. And by 1280, 1290, 1300, the area was no longer inhabitable for tens of thousands of people. That to me is a catastrophic event. And it's a, it was a catastrophic abandonment and depopulation of the area. And I think something catastrophic happened to cause that. And I don't think it was this drought, which certainly didn't help conditions, but really wasn't severe enough as we look at the entire record to cause people to decide to move and abandon their homeland. So that was kind of a long answer. But um, I think the real mystery, if we look at mysteries, and you know, you can, you can type into Google Anasazi or Pueblo Mystery, and it's going to say, where did these people go? Well, golly, that's not really a hard one, is it? We have Pueblo descendants all over the Southwest.
that's not a mystery. Why people left the large Four Corners region completely by 1290 or 1300, that is a genuine mystery. And if anyone can come up with a definitive answer that even, what, 50% of the archaeologists will agree with, that would be great. I, I have to feel that it was in the realm of the cosmological and ritual and, or, or, or perhaps a large scale social process that said, our people can't live here anymore. Because uh, we really don't see these types of large scale population dislocations very often at all without either a large group of people coming in to cause warfare, which we have no evidence for. We don't have any outside groups pressing in. We seem to have warfare between groups. That in and of itself may have been enough of a factor. But again, the widespread nature of the abandonment and every group sort of deciding ultimately, individually perhaps, but eventually as a group, they all left. And you know, as I look at the, the Middle San Juan River in particular around Farmington, there's no reason environmentally and climatically why the sites of Solomon and Aztec couldn't have continued to have been occupied until you know, the Spanish came in in 1539 and 1540. There's tons of water, and the water you know, it certainly varied with drought conditions, but they could have easily held on based on the fact that they survived the prior drought. So. Okay. Um, Paul, we brought you down here to talk about your, your excavations experience in the Chusca Valley, but um, kind of the biggest preservation archaeology issue in the southwest right now is the threat of fracking around the Chaco and landscape. Um, Paul is deeply involved in um, assessments and, and evaluations of this topic, and could you just give us a quick update on the, the latest news from, from the Chaco and landscape itself? Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is an issue that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, my colleague Matt Peoples, um, who's here, and Andy Lorenzi um, at Archaeology Southwest have um, sort of been taking this on for the last several months. Um, and, you know, fortunately, there's a number of environmental groups across the Southwest who are on the ground with this. Um, the Wilderness Group, the Wildlife Guardians, um, the National Parks and Conservation um, Association, um, a group out of Denver called the Western Energy Project, and really a dozen or two dozen other environmental groups that we've been in contact with and we've been talking about. But essentially, this, this came about because of this technology in the last really just five to six years that has allowed um, groups drilling in the San Juan Basin and actually across the country to tap into deposits that were previously inaccessible. inaccessible. These are in um, particularly hard strata of rock, and when they drill down, um, they basically get into the rock and then they inject um, water is the first step, and then different chemicals, sand, um, and the idea is to basically fracture, so it's called, called hydraulic fracturing, and they literally pump in millions of gallons of water through the life history of these wells. Along with chemicals, they use um, brine water, salt water is, is one component of it as well. This separates the strata and basically releases the oil that can then be pulled up through a more conventional means. Um, they're also able with um, some of the advances to do horizontal drilling so that they can tap into areas that were previously inaccessible because they couldn't get a well pad down into an area. Um, and that can actually cross cut um, vertical wells and then cause leakages and seepage from those. Um, but in, our, in the specific area around Chaco, leases have come up um, several times in the last couple of years. The most recent group was released, I think, in July of 2013. And some of these leases were literally on the margins of Chaco. So there was no buffer zone or any consideration of that. We had a couple leases that literally touched Chaco's northeast margin. So at that point, a whole bunch of groups, um, environmental groups, archaeological groups, said, you know, this is a bad idea. They gave input to BLM. Something like 81 leases were in that package, and BLM withdrew all but three. Um, so that, that seemed like a victory to folks trying to you know, examine this process and slow it down a little bit. But we, we fast forward a year here, and at this point, um, based on work that um, primarily Mike Eisenfeld, who works for the San Juan Citizens Alliance, um, based in Durango and Farmington, um, he's calculate, I think, 101 wells at this point that are already tapping the Manco Shale in different areas. Um, the Bureau of Land Management says that this is essentially an exploration of an oil field and that some of these other regulations uh, that might kick in haven't kicked in yet. What BLM has done is they've gone through um, what they call a, a resource ma management plan amendment. So 
they have a plan that was created in 2003 that basically guided, was supposed to guide oil and gas development and a whole lot of other things in the Farmington field office area, which includes this area right around Chaco. Well, this plan was developed in 2003 and the Manco Shale wasn't even being exploited or tapped. It wasn't even really on anyone's you know, horizon as it were. Um, so groups, oil groups started doing this based on experience they had in Pennsylvania and in North Dakota and other areas where they were using these techniques quite successfully. So they started to tap into um, these deposits that were previously inaccessible and then BLM a year or so into that process decided to modify this resource management plan. And so a lot of groups gave input to BLM on that. And you know, so there's basically been communication and a dialogue going, but one of the real issues at this point is in this area around Chaco, something like 90% of the available lands are already locked up in leases that companies have signed off on and the government has signed off on. Um, there's only about 10% of these lands that are not yet leased. Um, that included some of the lands that were withdrawn um, last year. So a bunch of us are engaged at this point with BLM trying to get um, a master leasing plan in place that would, that would um, provide greater protection for archeological and environmentally sensitive areas in the future for that 10%. And if, if we can go through the process, would then influence how perhaps some of that 90% in those leases that are existing but haven't yet been drilled, um, we could have some positive impact on that. Um, so there's other issues involved. That's, that's kind of the, the two cent summary. Um, you know, one, one group, um, the San Juan Citizens Alliance, recently sent a letter to BLM asking them to just put a moratorium on all Manco Shale development um, as of, I think they asked for December 1. Um, and that is unlikely to happen based on the processes that are rolling forward. But most of the groups that we're involved with are trying to sort of affect, positively affect the present and essentially, especially the future and try and get larger protection areas put in place. You know, some kind of buffer around Chaco Canyon National Park, buffers around the Great North Road, buffers around um, the known outliers up and down the road. Um, the other work that Matt and Andy and I have done over a few months is identify priority areas with archeological resources that are most at risk to this kinds of development. We've shared those maps with BLM and are asking them to consider that as well in their process of leasing and put some extra protection in place for these. Um, but this, the ball's rolling, so you know we're, we're basically trying to stop some momentum um, that could really greatly impact this greater Chaco landscape. And we, we could end up with Chaco surrounded with quite a few wells and then the, the sites we know of becoming islands with crisscrossing well pad roads, pipelines and things. And that's, that's what we're working hard to avoid. Portions of the San Juan Basin north of Chaco um, already look like that. The area right around Chaco is still relatively pristine, and we're really hoping to keep that for the future. Right, they're they're required to meet NEPA, the national. Right, they're required to meet NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, and you know Section 106, the National Historic Preservation Act. But those two laws really don't provide for adequate protection for this kind of a landscape. And and really, the what the basic policy for archaeological work countrywide is: you identify archaeological resources and you avoid them with your development. If you can't avoid them you go into some sort of mitigation or excavation phase and you recover what data you can. So, you know, a lot of these sites as individual sites are being avoided. They're trying, they're avoiding traditional cultural properties if they're identified in sacred sites. But the impact on the larger landscape is really what is alarming to folks, um, you know, environmental folks, just everyone, archeologists. And that's what we're trying to get the federal agency to look at in a more comprehensive way. And frankly, they, they deal with resources on the ground. They want a site, they want to know where a place is to avoid it. And, you know, we can't draw a circle around the entire San Juan Basin and say, you know, no more drilling here. Um, so the key is working within the agency structure and within their plan to get them to set aside or protect, offer greater protection for a lot of these sites. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a significant challenge 
All righty, Paul, thank you very much.